Hello, welcome. Thank you all for coming out to the second installment in our uh, autumn non-standard evenings. And uh, I'm going to start off this non-standard evening by turning off my cell phone. And if you would like to join me, if you feel like that's something that you're able to do, I recommend it because the topic uh, tonight is the trajectory of, of the work of French thinker and philosopher Francois Laruelle. And I suspect that most of you don't know who he is, so I'm going to try to give you um, some entry points into his work, um, which is <coughs> which is spanned 40 years. And um, the topic really is is an introduction to his work, but uh, it's also a question which is, and you'll understand perhaps later as you maybe leave here and look more closely at his work, um, because his project is called Non-Philosophy, and it's what he calls a mutation of philosophy, where philosophy becomes a science of and for philosophy. So that sounds probably complicated, and um, but hopefully, um, when I finish my lecture and we can talk, um, you'll understand why the question for tonight is, what is a non-workshop? <laughs> think about that and uh, think about turning off your cell phones. So, one of the first things that, that is difficult about introducing non-philosophy is it's a project built by a thinker who says, that uh, non-philosophy is a practice of philosophy as a material. And as a practice, or what he calls a theoretical practice of practice, practicity, it's a thought and action, it's a performance in a certain way. And it's not a whole, complete, thought out term, neatly enclosed, having a position of authority as a declarative proper name, which, which precisely it's striving not to be. And so for this case, it takes on what it's striving for as a generic term, rather than a singular identity. And because of this, there's a certain democratic strain um, of what it's trying to get at, trying to liberate the subject in the last instance. And he's trying to get at something that he thinks two great philosophers, Spinoza and Deleuze, tried to do, which is think eminence think philosophy in an eminent way. But he says they fail on that project because they, they try to represent eminence as opposed to treating eminence in an eminent manner. So for this reason, even for me to start talking about what non-philosophy is, <laughs> you have to be very careful. <laughs> because you immediately fall back, for La Ruelle especially, into philosophy. So this is quite a difficult task I'm going to try to do for you this evening. But I hope as I try to perform a non-workshop, I can maybe perhaps better not give a lecture, but do something that I think Lauderwell tries to do with his science, which is a highly poetic sort of attempt, which is to give you a sort of a diagrammatic sketch. So I would rather you consider what I'm trying to do in that matter, uh, or a doodle that maybe will provide you some sort of intuition in what he's getting at. And I hope I haven't lost you already, but if I have, perhaps all the better. <laughs> um, so Larry Bell started this project uh, probably in the late 80s, or excuse me, the mid 80s. But before that, he was um, known to be a close uh, colleague and admirer of the work of Gilles Deleuze, as some of you probably know, and um, also Jacques Derrida who you perhaps also know. And he's interesting to the extent that he's a French thinker that in the early 70s, while thinkers like Derrida and Deleuze were becoming popular abroad, they weren't really highly appreciated in France. And Lottery Well was one of the first thinkers finishing his PhD work in France that saw the interesting and novel ways they were trying to do work theory or philosophy. So in that manner, um, he was really close to their work. And in some ways, later on, uh, Derrida, there was a split in, in Derrida, almost said, you know, you're the only one who has rules to your game. And you're a sort of a terrorist of philosophy. 
And that was a big to-do in the early 90s. Um, but most people don't realize, at least people who've read, read Larry well, that he was quite close to these thinkers until, and especially Deleuze, who in one of his last texts um, with Felix Guattari, which is called What is Philosophy, there's a big footnote in there where he talks about somebody who's doing something interesting today that we should take note of. And that person was Francois Laruelle. And so as the years have kind of passed, Laruelle's work now slowly is, is, is coming to the, the forefront. And people are asking themselves, well, what is this science of philosophy? What could a science of and for philosophy be? So I'm going to try to get into what that would be uh, in a second. And um, I think the best way to do that is to, to, to basically go through um, using another thinker by the name of Gilles Châtelet, um, if I can find my notes here. Because Châtelet was a, a thinker of science and philosophy. Um, and I just recently read a book which I think gets a little bit at what he is trying to get at. Laruelle is trying to get at through his science, treating eminent, eminence in an eminent manner. You're going to have to excuse me while I shuffle through here to find where I start on that position. So one of the, the main things right away for Laruelle too is this question. Uh, philosophy should be our statement. Philosophy should be at the service of the human and not the human at the service of philosophy. And that's perhaps a good starting point to think about what he's trying to do. Um, he, he's suspicious of these big terms that philosophy usually takes as a starting point, which is thinking about desire and the capital D or identity or being. And he thinks that in some ways philosophy already makes a decision that it can philosophize about everything, the world. And for La Ruelle, there's a, it's an error. There's a, there's a principle of what he calls sufficient philosophy that is um, sort of gives sort of philosophy this sort of free pass uh, to think the world. Where for, for La Ruelle, philosophy is merely a part of eminence. It's, it's merely a part of the real. And so for him, that's a very important difference. And it took him a while, as I'll explain later, uh, to realize that. So as he became sort of close with the work, at the same time, he realized at some point that he needed to go further to what he wanted to do. And when he got to that point, it had a lot to do with bringing back not the man as anthropos or a sort of um, uh, animal or something of this sort of evolved animal, but man as an inherently separate sort of entity. And for him, he talks about, at least in various forms, the man and man, or the man in the last instance. But it's always something you can't quite define. Okay, so keep that in mind as we go here. So, let's see here. So, he basically broke with the deconstructionist in the mid-80s. And he wrote a book called Biography of an Ordinary Man. I have a copy here. It's not yet translated. And um, it's basically called Of Authorities and Minorities. And this is sort of his go-to material. Because you have to remember, again, as I'm even talking about Larwell in this way, we are already back in a representational form. So we're always trying to get, for him, we're already back in philosophy to even give a trajectory, give a history, as opposed to looking backwards. He's saying we have to always look in the last instance. And it's a very confusing sort of way to think, but it has to do with what he's trying to get at, which is, for him, is always trying to defend the human in the last instance, which he says philosophy doesn't always do. In fact, sometimes it's on the contrary. And as I read the other day, a reading from our recent publication of Struggle and Utopia at the End Times of Philosophy, perhaps uh, there's a new place for what he calls harassment to arrive. And so uh, that might come up later when I talk about uh, our relationship to the digital. But I'm going to read you a little excerpt from Biography of an Ordinary Man. I translated just a small piece because I think it kind of gets at what his science is striving for. And then I think I'll be able to go back to Chatelet and it'll make a little more sense. 
So bear with me here. I'm going to read a little excerpt for you. Um, and this is what, this is the sh turning point for him from being what we would call perhaps a, just a regular philosopher to maybe just perhaps a non-philosopher or a better, an ordinary man. So this is an excerpt from the first pages of Biography for an Ordinary Man. A Rigorous Science of Man. We are correct in wanting to revolt against the philosophers, but why? Is the revolt not its own reason? One more reason? But is it not the philosophers who are dispensing reason, and in particular reasons for revolt, dispense revolt? Should one not finally stop revolting and construct one's existence within a strong but tolerant indifference towards philosophy? Ordinary man, a finite individual that we, all, we also could name minorities, locates itself within this indifference, that it draws from itself rather than philosophy. We will back five theses here, more like five theorems, human theorems. So these are the theorems he starts his shift into what he calls his science of non-philosophy. Number one, man truly exists, and he is distinct from the world, a thesis that contradicts almost all of philosophy. Two, man is a living mystic condemned to action, a contemplative being bound towards practice for reasons he is unaware of. Three, as a living practice, man is condemned a second time and for the same reason to philosophy. And four, the du this double condemnation organizes man's destiny, and this destiny is called the world with the capital W, history with the capital H, language with the capital L, sexuality with the capital S, power with the capital P. And this is in these, these capital letter words here are what we denote in general as authorities. Five, a rigorous science of the ordinary man is possible. A biography of the individual as minorities and authorities. A theoretically constructed description of the life he lives between these two poles and which are enough to define him. Excuse the translation, it was done uh, maybe a little rough, but it was done strictly for the workshop so you can get an early idea of where his project started from, where he kind of shifts from philosophy and places the human there. And so he goes on then in 1989 to really, um, really decide this is where I'm going to start really trying to separate myself from philosophy and, and give back to philosophy. Because there's, there's perhaps some mis misconceptions about the non. And for him, he says, look at the non and non-philosophy like the non uh, and non-Euclidean geometry.